The Mel Hurry Show and Mel Hurry Films stand with the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. All promotional interviews will be based on non-union members only until after the strike has resolved. Welcome to the Mel Hurry Show, when we talk all things film, media and entertainment. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Mel Hurry Show. Today I have vocalist, music composer Raquel Acevedo Klein all the way from New York. Welcome to the Mel Hurry Show, Raquel. Thank you so much, Mel, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You are very welcome. It's really great to have you here. So in order to get the, you know, the party started, can you tell us a little bit more about you and how you got into music and and becoming a vocalist? Sure. So I'm uh, based, born and raised in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I came up from a community of musicians that uh, kind of traverse so many different styles of music. And while nobody in my family is a musician, I did come from a family of visual artists. Um, And so I feel really grateful to be immersed in a world that very much support and supports and uplifts the arts. And so for me, starting from the age of six, I was uh, taking piano lessons with my piano teacher, who I continue to take lessons with to this day. And uh, she brought me up in genres uh, spanning, you know, jazz, classical, and everything in between. Mm-hmm. And same thing with my voice teacher. So as a vocalist, a conductor, and as a pianist and instrumentalist, I feel really lucky to live in a world and to have been brought up in a world that really embraces all of those different styles of music and of music making. Definitely. So in terms of, I mean, that sounds like years and years of practice and perfection. So how long did it take you to get where you are? I mean, do you still find that you need to practice? Give us a bit. Oh, of it. 100%. I mean, it's, uh, there's never the sense of perfection. I'm constantly, um, you know, working on myself, and especially in the sense that um, something that I was really grateful for. And the reason why I've kept with my piano teacher, for instance, for, for this long is that she really helped instill in me a sense of appreciation for practice, that music is not just about the end result, but about the process of making it, and especially of collaborating with people, which is kind of at the heart and soul of what I do uh, in in the various roles that I take on as a musician. So yeah, um, yeah I'm really grateful to, to practice and to like actually love that process, that it's not just about performance and recording projects and the end result, but rather, the process of building on myself and um, kind of like constant, you know, mindfulness and uh, practice as a human being, because musicianship is, you know, the practice of being engaged with yourself and with people. Absolutely. We'll pick up on a little bit around the mindfulness and the well-being side a little sure. bit later, because it's definitely yeah. something that I love to talk about. And yeah. for the viewers out there, unfortunately, I have a fly that's decided to... Um, attend the the actual interview with Raquel so it's like our third uninvited guest here so if you find me waving my arms around please just ignore me and just listen to Raquel because yeah I did not invite this guest at all so thanks a lot Fly you're coming at the right time (laughs) perfect timing okay so in terms of your sound how would you describe it for for those that have just found you and wanting to know more about Raquel sure Um, So as a vocalist, uh, I find that my sound, again, kind of traverses so many different styles of music. I am, uh, if you want to put it into like strictly classical terms, Mm -hmm. I am a light coloratura soprano, which means that I love to sing those skyrockety high notes. Amazing. Um, And that's kind of the world that I really enjoy living in. So if you ever need somebody who can like, you know, kind of, Uh, ascend to the heavens that's very much a place that I live in Um, but I also really much embrace um, the style and uh, nature of singing within the jazz world and within Mm. the pop world a lot of the artists that I grew up singing with include like John Legend and Alicia Mm -hmm. Keys and uh, you know a regular collaborator of like you know uh, working with bands like Arcade Fire or The National or uh, grizzly bear so like a lot of those kind of pop styles and non-classical um, forms of singing are very much a part of my singing as well um, so yeah a combination of everything if, if you 
if you need uh, a sound that is still intrinsically mine, but can take place in so many different contexts, I would say that that's the definitive thing about my voice. Absolutely. And it's absolutely beautiful. So for those of you listening or watching this interview, you know, um, I'll put in the details of where you can find Raquel's music because her voice, your voice, Raquel, is absolutely gorgeous. So um, it's it was very nice to just hear something different, eclectic, and, and it just kind of took you onto a nice journey. So yeah, it was really, it was dreamy. Loved it. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. So you've mentioned quite um, a number of names there that you've um, said with who would you say are your inspirations would it be those that that you have sang with would you have some other inspirations that kind sure. of yeah I mean them? one of my like idols of all time who's a dear friend is Shara Nova who is the um front woman of uh or or goes by the band moniker called my brightest diamond and uh she comes from a world of both opera and non-classical mm-hmm. forms of, of singing and um you know, a lot of her collaborations span from being on many, you know, records with Sufjan Stevens and, and also uh, writing her own opera, You Us, We All, which premiered at Brooklyn Academy of Music several years ago. And I'm just so inspired by not only, you know, her songwriting, but also just how tremendous and versatile her voice is. And, uh, and also just what a resonant spirit she is, somebody who, um, goes through that uncharted territory of how do you operate as a singer, as a vocalist, and as an artist that um, does not take on one path, but kind of creates a new one for themselves that is unique to their instrument and their artistry. And that for me is very important and why I'm so appreciative and inspired by her. Absolutely. Sounds absolutely amazing. So recently, you've kicked off a tour in New York City. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the tour? Like, what venues have you played? What's the reception been like? Give us a bit of an insight as to what's going on at the moment. Sure. Um, I recently did an engagement at The Shed, which uh, just uh, um, implemented a 360 degree sonic sphere um, okay. that was suspended in midair in the venue um, where there were over 100 speakers in, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, 360 degree sound environment, wow. where we got to perform a piece that I wrote for myself um, in 40 different voice parts. So um, for this performance, I got to both sing live and to also sing with 40 versions of pre-recorded layers of my voice. Wow. Um, and so for the audience, that meant that they got to hear my voice coming from like every which direction. Amazing. Um, yeah. And it was supported with some electronics that I incorporated into the piece. And that piece was called uh, Polyphonic Interlace. And it was very much something that I started making within my home studio during the pandemic lockdown where we couldn't um, sing with other people. And so I decided to create a choir of myself uh, that could then be transmitted through venues like this. And so I was really mm-hmm. grateful that The Shed gave me the opportunity to perform uh, in such an immersive um, environment. It was really spectacular. And so that was kind of the start. Um, and then from there, uh, the next week, I had a show at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden to, it was, yeah. uh, there were 1,640 people in attendance. And um, it was uh, a concert that I got to share the stage with two of my closest collaborators, Angelica Negron and Darian Donovan Thomas, who together we um, basically incorporated original compositions. So several of my pieces uh, we all um, jumped in on um, mm-hmm. and uh, I was the you know lead vocalist, but I, I incorporated electronics and electroacoustic instruments and uh, all of the music that was made, some of which was improvised, um, was projected into a, a multifaceted house speaker system that spanned an entire um, like third of this expansive uh, botanic garden. Wow. Um, and so people got to sit in the audience, but hear sounds like, similarly to the sonic sphere coming yeah. from so many different directions. And to be able to sing through that was such a gift. Um, and in fact, one one audience member came up to me after the show and said that 
he was uh, walking outside of the botanic garden, which is enclosed by a tall fence. Mm -hmm. And um, because he had heard my voice singing, like he heard like this gorgeous voice coming from afar, he felt compelled to climb the fence and break oh, wow. into the concert. <laughs> and while I was like, I don't condone that activity at a concert, <laughs> um, I, it was like, you know, really nice to see that, you know, the voice kind of speaks to somebody in that way. Um, I think it's really nice the fact that you're pulling in people that are just the fact that he felt compelled to climb a fence like for right. me, that that just shows that how amazing your voice is how powerful <laughs> you are as an artist that you've been able to get someone to do that so <laughs> right. you're, you're reaching you're, you're getting the reach that you need I think <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, that's grateful to make a connection you know I just love people yeah. that's why I do this <laughs> Absolutely. So like the planning involved, because obviously, like you said, there were like, you know, some of it was improvised, but there must have been a lot of preparation for this. Um, like how long was this plan? Did the planning take before this tour started? To be honest, we allotted four days to rehearse oh. the entire program for which it was a two hour program of yeah. nonstop music. There were no like breaks for claps in between. Every piece kind of wove into the next one through um you know these improvised uh kind of more ambient sounding moments mm -hmm. um but what it, it was really interesting because you have to time it perfectly to a two-hour duration um you can't kind of a lot for space um in between yeah. songs for for audience but um what was really nice was that because these are two of my closest collaborators we were able to kind of create a ballpark of what each piece would um, stretch out to um, in the way that we were playing it. And we were really sensitive to each other. I think one of the most important elements of, of music making for me is how much, not only how much uh, that I'm listening to my collaborators and kind of yeah. playing and singing to what they're doing so that it feels like a really intimate dialogue and mm -hmm. thinking about that in tandem with the audience and how we're responding to the audience's needs and the moment and the energy of the room, um, I think really helped um, put together in our minds uh, a program like that that could fit within that time limit. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. Amazing. Sounds like it's almost like a, a cohesive scientific um, experience in that sense where, you know, you're reading the your other, your collaborators, you're feeding off of the audience, you're trying to really kind of sure. in tune of it. So, yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Sounds absolutely. great. <laughs> so in terms of um, your next, um, your upcoming shows, what else could we um, could we anticipate? I mean, obviously, may, it's all going to be in New York, I believe. So what sure, other yes. venues are you playing? Um, so next up, I have a concert at Lincoln Center. Um, think, yeah. And uh, thankfully, like Lincoln Center has given me a platform to play my own music, incorporate my own collaborators. And it's through this festival um, uh, that the umbrella presenter and producer of this uh, concert and festival is New Latin Wave. And as somebody who is both Puerto Rican and Colombian, it's mm -hmm. nice to be represented um, through uh, a gathering of artists that are fellow, you know, uh, members of the Latinx community. Yeah. Um, and, and to be able to present music that, you know, speaks to that part of my identity too, um, but to also incorporate how multifaceted the last Latinx community is and, and how much of a mixture of, you know, different things that I come from are. Um, as I've been saying, kind of like, you'll, you'll notice that a theme of a lot of the music that I make is that it comes from different styles of music, different areas of music, different cultures of music. Yeah. Um, but in a, in addition, you know, mixed heritage of mine. So, um, so yeah, I'm really excited to bring forward a program of original work uh, at Lincoln Center, one of the premier you know, venues of, of exactly, New York. yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you know you've really kind of made a, a really good point, you know, especially around diversity and inclusivity as well. Just trying to bring you know music, world music into into what you do, and right. you know sometimes we could steer away from that. You could either stay into like one, okay, I'm only going to do classical, and it's just going to be like you know a westernized way of doing it, right? 
Mm. you know, without incorporating other, you know, fusion is probably the best way to probably describe it. And it seems like that's what you're trying to do. Is that right? In in some sense, I mean, there, mm -hmm. I would say like, what's really important to me as a musician is to be immersed in the communities and bodies of music that um, uh, stem from its roots, yeah. um, but to not necessarily, um, you know, pretend that I, that I am, uh, you know, taking or, or creating an artificial version of that music. That's, of that's course. not my aim. It's, yeah. it's more like there are so many bodies of music in the world that expand the way in which we listen to music yes. and, mm -hmm. and the process of listening and practicing different bodies of music then informs how I can kind of incorporate, you know, my own voice, my unique voice um, mm -hmm. through that expanded palette. Um, it's like taking um, or, or using different pigments of paint and seeing how much color can be incorporated into a single piece of of art and in yeah. fact as a visual artist that's something that I take very seriously <laughs> yeah absolutely um, but for example I mean growing up in South Brooklyn where um there is an incredibly rich community of Arabic musicians mm. um Arabic music was a big part of my upbringing getting to study with people mm -hmm. who have you know come from so many different parts of the Arab world I got to learn different genres of music within Arabic music. And right. not only that, it's it's not just listening to songs within that world, but also understanding the 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 theory and the music behind it enabled me to listen for pitches and tones that in Western music we just either think of as like out of tune or just not part of the canon. Yeah. And so yeah. I really appreciate incorporating that expanded palette of sounds and harmonies. Um, into into the music that I make and practice. One hundred percent. No, I'm with you on that one. And also, you get to understand the different cultures and and of course the um the different regions it's from. So, like you know, where you're mentioning around Arabic music, it's not just one traditional Arabic music. There's so exactly. many different it's cultures so and traditions vast. involved in that. Same with Latin America. You know, Latin Mexican. Yes. Indian whatever you know there's right. so many different types of uh right. yeah types of that particular music that you will totally. understand because it will come from different lands and different regions so absolutely amazing and you start to one of my people. best friends is mm -hmm. oh I'm so sorry that's okay no carry on <laughs> uh my my best friends Bridget Bergen um she and I uh really formed a bond around South Indian classical music around Carnatic music yeah. And a lot of the um, systems of not just um, uh, ragas of like, you know, pitch centered modes, but also like rhythmic modes, like thinking about rhythms as like um, yeah. backbones of composition and things like that. And engaging in performances that incorporate so many different styles, even within that body of music alone has been like, has been such a nurturing and enriching experience for us. So I'm always continuing to learn yeah. Um, and grow you know my own palette uh, just through so many incredible musicians that I get to interact with in every every day you know that's no it's really beautiful to hear it it's definitely it's an experience it's kind of like it's an art ex uh, you know an art experience in that sense mm -hmm. because yeah. like you said about you know expanding your palette and really kind of understanding that it's really great to hear would you say that helps you you know because I mean obviously we spoke a little bit about you mentioned about well-being and um you know uh, you know kind of having that mindfulness practice would you say that helps you in terms of maintaining that balance like listening to different music and then being able to adapt it how does that work for you 100 um, percent yeah. I I think it's you know as, as somebody who I deal with a very busy schedule um, and sometimes that can be really stressful um, but the work that I do is fueled by a passion that I have for music and so one way in which I continue to incorporate that energy into the work that I produce is to as I was saying earlier um make sure that or or prioritize that my practice is part of um uh of nurturing like who i am as a as a person uh, yeah. in in and of itself it's not just that i'm making music to make music but rather that the act of making music is a, a way of um kind of exploring my own intuition exploring like 
at being kind of an introspective human being. And that start, started with, I always kind of go back to my piano teacher because she's been such a part of my kind of philosophical outlook as a, not just a musician, but also just as a human being in general. And that was um, through, from day one in my lessons with her, we started each lesson with an improvisation based on a mode. So mm-hmm. not just, you know, playing our scales or making sure that, you know, I get my pieces right exactly. It's like, here is a collection of notes that when put together and played in either a melodic form or a harmonic form, evoke all of these moods. And through yeah. that, getting to channel your unique voice um, through that particular collection of notes, for me, is like such an important part of just exploring my identity and Definitely. and just reflecting on who I am and getting to know what my voice is, knowing that I need to start climbing up the piano um, and getting to these higher pitches because that's yeah. speaking to me in the very moment. But also knowing that somebody else on the other side is listening to that and hearing the organic tapering of notes and the swell of notes getting into a louder, more chaotic place and then also getting into a softer kind of more um relaxed place and so I'm very sensitive to those things and Mm -hmm. it's also just like a very it's almost like a yeah uh, a way of of relaxing and just feeling more present yeah absolutely yeah and feeling present is so important because we do get so caught up in our own heads and our own schedule right? and everything so yeah you need to take you have to have something that takes you away from it be in the moment and yes, yes. I, I would agree yeah absolutely music is definitely one of those things yeah. um, so just talking about like some of the feedback you've received so Washington Post called you the classical composer and performer to watch in 2022 now I know we're in 2023 and I'm sure this still stands but how did that make you feel like earning that feedback or that title almost <laughs> well it's it's really um I mean it feels like a blessing it, it came from again the the community and relationships that I have with people within the music world mm-hmm. um I think that more than anything has fueled the opportunities that I have um, within music. Obviously, like, you know, I, I very much want to maintain a strong and rigorous music practice. And, uh, but I think that coupled with my immense passion for collaboration has led to that kind of recognition. Um, So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that I feel like a recognition like that comes out of uh, what is an innate place in my heart, which is a deep desire to collaborate with people and also a steadfast practice that's rooted in so many different parts of music making. Mm-hmm. And especially when engaging with projects that don't have anything that came before it to um, it's like these are new and kind of innovative projects that don't quite have something to refer back to. Um, It's not like everything that I conduct is something that I can listen to an earlier recording of in the past and then premiere it. Um, It's more like I get called in to conduct something that has never been performed before. And I think what people do seek in hiring me is uh, they understand that a lot of my strengths lie in being able to imagine and envision a direction for implementing something completely new and fresh. Um, And to do that in a a warm, uh, collaborative way um, Mm -hmm. that is also very clear and and direct. So I think that's that's where that (laughs) recognition comes from. Yeah, no, it's absolutely amazing. And also, you know, for those of you that have maybe you've already heard some of Raquel's music or, you know, or are going to listen to it, you do get this atmosphere like I said you know earlier it does take you on a journey you do feel like you're being transported and I think that's the, that's the importance of it because that for me that's what music should do it should transport you somewhere somewhere beautiful not somewhere sad um, we want we want to feel <laughs> right. uplifted although sometimes you know some people do want to kind of delve into a bit of sadness and that's fine right. but you know the idea is to kind of go through this journey and uh, and everything and I think it's absolutely phenomenal just that type of music the the 
art again that goes into what you've composed it's really her it's heard so Thank yeah you. it's absolutely and for me I think I'd probably climb up the fence just to go and, <laughs> and you, not that I would actually do that I would buy a ticket so. <laughs> I appreciate that on all fronts really <laughs> excellent so obviously like now you know it is quite busy because you are playing so many events so other than you playing music and that kind of helps you get through it what other things do you do to balance your lifestyle Sure. Uh, well, there are a few things. I mean, in between performances, I'm actually working on a couple of films. Um, in fact, uh, one of my dearest collaborators, uh, Richard Reed Perry, who's um, from Arcade Fire, we're actually co-writing um, some music and recording music for a theatrical film called Adrian's Castle, where Amazing. I'm essentially yeah. overdubbing the vocals to one of the lead actresses' um, voices, because this film is about a couple um, who together built um, a castle together in the States. And when the wife, Adrian, passes away, um, her voice, her singing voice, uh, lives within the fabric and the architecture of this castle that she built with her husband. And so it's been such a gift to be able to take this time now where I have a couple of weeks in which I'm not performing to really dive into the kind of music uh, and uh, um, recording that that we get to write for that film. And then in addition, um, so yes, I also work as a visual artist and as a writer. And at the same time, I'm also working on another film, which actually is a commission from uh, an opera company called Opera Philadelphia. And uh, I'm writing this story about my mom and oh, wow. her origin story. And it's yeah. been really nice to collaborate with my brother, for example, who's a screenwriter and a, a film producer to really hone in on a story that speaks very much to uh, my own origins and yeah. to a very personal place in my life. And it's a story that um, is about my mom at the cusp of being a, a, a mom to me and, uh, and how she, um, having been born and raised in New York herself, uh, was actually born out of wedlock and had never felt a sense of family, a sense of like a family unit or or a group of people that she belonged to. And so this film that I'm, that I'm writing and also creating as an operatic film for which I will be playing the role of my mom, um, yeah, (laughs) is about, um, the decision she has to make when she finally receives confirmation of being uh, pregnant with with me. Um, She has to make the decision suddenly of how she wants to raise or create a family from the very tiny roots that she has. Um, And one of the stakes of the story, one of the conflicts that are at play is that when she uh, reveals to her mom that she's pregnant and excited to expand their tiny family, her mom tells her that she's about to move back to her home island of Puerto Rico in yeah. order to, you know, reconnect with this estranged family from yeah. my mom's yeah. father's side. And so one of the like crazy origins of my mom's story was that her father revealed to um, her mom, my grandparents, uh, he, he revealed to her that he was already married and had eight wow. kids back in Puerto Rico. And so one of the things that I'm writing in the story is like, how does the central character, in this case, my mom, deal with this decision of either raising me mm-hmm. by herself in New York yeah. or following her mom and her you know, distant father back to Puerto Rico to perhaps establish a relationship with a really distant family that she's always felt kind of cast out from. Wow. Um, and so it's been a really, um, it's been a really important point of connection for me and my family. Um, and it's been actually a really, uh, wonderful catharsis, I think for all of us to process this story yeah. through music and through just, you know, narrative. It's the first time I've written a screenplay, wow. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but yeah. I'm really excited about it. Um, Excellent. And, and the, 
Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was about to say, well, we're gonna have to have you back on the show to talk more about when it starts <laughs> yeah. to when you start to make it, because it sounds absolutely it sounds like a beautiful film. Oh, um thank you. and yeah, it's definitely something that I would love to talk more about, sure. you know, in 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 the near future. So when do you get time for all of this? Like how do you divide <laughs> your time? Do you sleep in between or you're up all night? How does sleep it work? Sleep is the question. It really, really <laughs> is. And lots of coffee. <laughs> right? Honestly, you know, as a singer, it's there are so many limitations to what we exactly. can do. Coffee has never been like a viable option for me. And yeah. I think, you know, it goes back to all of those things where the reason why I do what I do, the reason why I take on different roles is that they kind of energize me. I'm not yeah. just doing one thing on repeat. It's exactly. I'm doing so many different things that in fact, like teach me how to do other things. Mm -hmm. And for instance, like with, with visual art, I maintain like a strict practice as a visual artist because it informs like how it, just thinking compositionally and being able to draw people from life uh, is a way of building energy for me that's different from the way I make music. And so uh, one of the first things that I did once I graduated from mu music school was I started teaching um, anatomical figure drawing to wow. adults um, yeah. because it was something that my parents, it, there are some parents who like force their kids to like keep practicing their scales and their chords. My yeah. parents didn't know anything about music, but I would say that their version of that was forcing me and by forcing meaning mm -hmm. like really strongly supporting yeah I was excited about um teaching me how to like draw from life and to wow. really be able to like draw yeah. portraiture and people um which you know okay. takes a lot of kind of practice <laughs> and draftsmanship yeah. and uh so that energizes me I would say Excellent. Yeah. And I think also that's almost like a like an active meditation as well, because totally. when you're doing something that you really enjoy, you're just in the zone. And that's basically where that meditation or meditative 100%. state comes in. So, yeah, it's brilliant. I love it. So yeah. in terms of what's coming next, so what can we anticipate from you? So obviously we we, we know about the film projects um, <laughs> yeah. on the music side. Is there anything else coming? Are there going to be more events uh, throughout the year, more to come? Are you going to do a world tour? We'd love to have you in London. We need to get you into London as well. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. I would so love to expand kind of my geographic horizons yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, and I do. It's It hasn't been... Um, the scheduling, the exact scheduling hasn't been confirmed, but uh, I am supposed to do a residency with this incredible laboratory, Kai Labs, um, mm -hmm. uh, who's created this wireless uh, transmission of multi-channel sound. So mm -hmm. a lot of the music that I put into the sonic sphere that I was telling you at the shed, mm -hmm. I will be working on in residence in London um, at some point in the new year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but I also, yeah, in the new year, I'm going to be uh, working on these uh, films. So not just the writing of it, but the recording of it and of the course. filming of it. Yeah. Um, and then in addition, I have several concerts um, uh, in which I will be uh, processing my voice through electronics mm -hmm. um, and incorporating like early music, like Renaissance music wow. into like something that's kind of more rhythmically driven and um, kind of uh, somewhat pop driven, but also electronics driven um, with many different collaborators throughout the year. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's, it's kind of hard to like put all a uh, chronological into order. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But it sounds so exciting. Yeah. You really do need to keep us updated on how things are going. I'm definitely going to make sure I'm going to keep an eye on your socials and everything. Uh, oh, yeah. so that, you know, we're seeing what is Raquel up to. And totally. whilst I'm talking about socials, where can our viewers and listeners find you so we can keep up to date with, with this amazing journey that you're on? Sure. Yes, you can find me definitely on Instagram. It's my name, Raquel.a.klein. Okay. Um, and uh, you can definitely find me on my website, RaquelAcevedoKlein.com. And something that I'll be incorporating into my socials is a project that I'm doing uh, with an artist in residence at NASA and the European yes. Space Agency. We're going to be working wow. on a project that's a virtual reality meets 360 audio experience uh, where we're basically unpacking the universe 
through like uh, a visual art and musical lens. So be wow. on the lookout for um, some multi-layered music coming your way in a VR yeah. experience and uh, through, yes, the European Space Agency and NASA. Amazing. Okay, yeah. so viewers, listeners, please keep on with it. This sounds amazing. I I just want to attend all of these events now because <laughs> they, it, it speaks to me. It speaks my language. And yeah, I'm really, really happy for, you know, the whole journey that you've been on and where you're going. And also in terms of the film side of it, I'm a filmmaker and screenwriter myself. So yeah, so I'm all about yeah creativity and music is another passion of mine as well. So so I feel like we're speaking the right language here. So this is amazing. Oh, I'm and so grateful to be here. I'm, yeah. great. I'm really glad. Yeah, I'm really glad we did this. I mean, in terms of um, any last bits of advice that you'd like to offer anyone, anyone who's thinking actually moving into something that's a bit more contemporary and sure. uh, in terms of music. Well, you know, it's as somebody who operates in spaces that are have long been established, like, you know, for instance, a lot of collaborations that I have are like with the New York Philharmonic or with like Carnegie Hall. Um, I think we live in a time, especially coming out of the pandemic from the last few years, mm -hmm. um, where we're witnessing, especially within the arts world, um, a need and a hunger for um envisioning what's new and imaginative, um, but also referencing or uh, acknowledging things from our past, even things that have been hidden from our past. Yeah. And so my advice to people is that there is no recipe for what you are supposed to do or, or um, uh, meaning uh, something that, you know, I remember kind of having to come up against when I was in school was like being told that in order to be a singer of uh, this kind of singer, I had to do this, this, and this. Yeah. And I think um, it's important to not constrict ourselves to a one cut recipe for being who we want to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for any creative to listen to the things that speak to them and to really nurture that in the ways that, and through the outlets that are supportive of that. If you find a roadblock um, in one form, don't worry, that's not the end. There are so many other platforms through which you can explore and so many ways through which your art form can be disseminated. Um, we live in a, a way like in, in a, a day and age where music is disseminated in different ways so yeah. as creative people like how can we expand the ways in which we share our music um is is the main advice that i would give um and the same thing for yes filmmakers for visual artists definitely um, for creatives of any kind is that the platform is endless and all the world is a stage yes and yeah. what kind of stage you make uh i think can also be an extension of the art that you share so that would be my advice. Amazing advice. Absolutely. You're speaking, I'm pretty sure you're speaking to everyone's soul right now who wants to kind of get in. If they're not already in the creative space or they're looking to get into it, I think you've just really opened them up to um, opportunities, which is sometimes we don't tend to see a lot of opportunities because, again, we're so engrossed in our own minds or, you know, we're, we're so engrossed in right. the daily grind that we don't see other things that could be that could open up for us. So right. absolutely love it. Yeah. excellent well thank you so much Raquel for being such an amazing guest on the Mel Hari show oh, um I'm looking forward to hearing about your journey viewers listeners please make sure you follow her on socials I'll be dropping this all on the uh in the comments below uh but yeah we can't wait to hear more about you and we'll look forward to having you back on the show again to talk about your film thank you so much Mel it's such a gift to be here with you today <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the show. For more content on social media, don't forget to follow at Mel Hurry Films on Instagram or you can email me at themelhurry at gmail.com. Take care. Bye.